My guest today is Joe Conk. Joe, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Welcome back to the show. It hasn't been that long. No, it's only been about um, nine months, months, maybe? Five months? Oh, man, I guess it has been longer than I thought. <laughs> um, what, what do you want to talk about today? Well, I want to talk about a project I've been working on for uh, a little over a year now. It's a automation project for UI testing. And what's different about this is that it is testing Windows apps and not web apps. Right. Yeah, so uh, UI testing is always pretty tricky. It's a little bit fragile, and the tooling mm -hmm. isn't nearly as robust as it is for, say, unit testing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yep. T t tell me some of the challenges of UI testing. So the challenge is, obviously, we had to find a framework that would allow us to reach in and, and touch the uh, destination application, the testing application. Um, so we found a good framework. Uh, it's an open source framework, and um, you know, in terms of actually doing the testing, uh, just to kind of give some background to this, you know, I, I work for a company, a uh, consulting company called Dewpoint, and we had a client ask us to help us improve their, qual you know, quality uh, through UI testing, and um, so this is actually a C sharp application written in uh, framework 4.7.2. Uh, and it used, leverages this uh, library called the FLA UI, FLA UI library. It's an open source NuGet package. Um, and we use that to uh, write and automate the, the UI testing program that will go over into the production application and operate it as if you were a user. So, you know, to make the distinction clear, uh, this is not a. Um, uh, you know, unit test, right? We're not writing code within the application itself. We're automating the elements, uh, screen elements of the application using the Microsoft uh, native uh, Windows automation uh, or tools that are, um, I think they're available because of accessibility. And the library that we actually leverage within Fly UI is Microsoft's UIA3 library. Hmm. And Does it stand for something? User. Interface accessibility, I mean? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, user interface accessibility three. And then, there, so UI, when you, ins when you uh, install Fly UI, you install the core um, NuGet package, and then you have a choice of UIA2 or UIA3. Two hmm. works best with WinForms because it's a little bit older technology. And then uh, UIA3 works with WPF and, and then, you know, at least the more modern um, Windows interfaces that I still work. call them Metro apps. <laughs> yeah, it, and it works with Windows Stores apps. The UIA3 does. Yep. Uh, very cool. Um, and to be clear, this is different from a tool like Selenium, which is um, designed for, as my understanding, is designed for web apps. Right. It, it follows a lot of the same principles, but it's totally okay. separate. It's totally separate in that it's for Windows. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think. Um, uh, UI testing, uh, the, one of the reasons it's a challenge is that you're trying to emulate something that a user is doing, clicking on buttons, entering text into a text box, mm -hmm. um, uh, selecting from a drop-down list, things like that. Um, so the tool has to be able to automate that, and then it also has to be able to read from the, the, the object. Correct. The screen. Correct. Right. And we started out with a uh, tool based on um, Appium. And the problem with that was that it could see what was on the screen, but it couldn't see anything else. So, for example, if we had a data grid, we couldn't see any of the elements that were off the screen from the data grid. Uh, and, and it ended up making the testing very fragile. So we, uh, we switched to the Fly UI. What's nice about the Fly UI is since it's a wrapper around the accessibility uh, API of Windows, it exposes the native controls of the WPF application, for example, the one I'm testing. So I see combo boxes, and I see text boxes, and I see, you know, the the, the elements that we're accustomed to as a developer in in those uh, applications. And so, and it exposes it exposes the things that we tend to need for automation. So I have a click event, and I have a, a, the ability a command that'll type into a box, and uh, I can you know drop down a drop box with a with a um, expand command and 
things like that. So it'll even do things like tell me whether an, uh, an element is visible on the screen or not, or if it's enabled or not. So right. it, it allows for a lot more complex uh, logic in terms of testing. And unlike the first thing that we worked with, it does give us the actual object. So I can walk the rows of a data grid to see what's in that data grid, even if the data grid is not fully you know, displayed on the screen. Well, okay, as long as it's in memory, as long as it exists, then Correct. and it's part of uh, uh, this object model. So it's, it's walking, we say walking through, we're walking through some hierarchical uh, containership hierarchy yeah. of mm -hmm. the window form and the buttons on the part of the grid on the form, the rows in the grid, the, the cells right. in the row, that sort right. of thing. So you see, when you're working with uh, this tool, you do see that um, tree, uh, tree structure of all these screen elements, uh, and it'll... There's an uh, application that Microsoft released called, um, let me see here, uh, I wrote it down so I can say it correctly, the WinApp Driver UI Recorder. <laughs> okay. And it's been out since 2018. Uh, and what it does is uses a small little app, you run it, and then you put your cursor over the screen element that you want to automate, and it will give you the full path of that screen element within the application. Oh, very nice. And it, it is an XPath uh, expression. And that XPath XPath expression is enough for me to be able to walk down to it and access it from the automation program. Walk me through the developer experience, or I should say the tester experience. Are you writing code when I am. you use this tool? I am. C-sharp code? It is C-sharp code. It's an application written in, like I said, framework 4.72. Uh, there is no manual tester involved whatsoever. It is all, it's just an application that we run. Uh, we've got uh, a couple, uh, several dozen uh, tests in it now, and they run every night. And uh, when they run, they produce an email, uh, and that email is structured to inform, you know, our users and, and us developers, uh, you know, what passed, what didn't, and gives us counts and summaries and error messages and all the wonderful things that we need to be able to keep it going and have it, you know, easily resolve any issues that we see. Okay, but as a developer, as I'm, if I'm creating, if I'm writing this code, is it's in its own separate test project, correct? It is completely separate you project. You mentioned a NuGet package. Is that what I need to get started with it? Yes, you need the flyui.core NuGet package, and then you need one of the flyui.uia3 or uia2 packages because it has to have one of the two uh, automation interfaces to use. Back in the day when I used to write Windows apps, <laughs> I did. Uh, use a couple of testing tools, and some of them were easier to use than others. Uh, some of them I had to write all the code myself, but there were some of them that actually I could turn on a recorder and it would actually and, and click a button, and it would write the code that said give that access to that button object, button dot click, and that sort of thing. Does this mm -hmm. tool have anything like that? It does not. At least I don't use it. I mean, I, I go into the application, I find the element, I, I find the XPath, and then I just write the C-sharp code to, to access it uh, myself. You know, after you've written a couple tests, the, it gets very familiar, and so it becomes pretty fast. Got it. Um, and then there's uh, always, uh, you know, the, the, any testing. You have arrange, act, assert, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so arrange, you've given, you've, you've got a screen visible on in front of you. Um, and uh, act is the act of clicking the button, mm -hmm. and assert, I guess, is in this case right. validating that right. something happened. The button, right. another, another button is enabled, some text displays, it, it navigates to the next screen. Right. Um, what's, uh, when we do our assertions, are, is that assertion logic built right into the framework, or are you tapping into something like NUnit? It's custom coded. I custom code okay. the, the, the tests. Um, and this is because I want the additional flexibility to, to not um, have to work within a framework of, of any unit. Um, so our, in this case, since we're testing UI uh, of a very complex professional application, we actually, it, this application brings in files and you log into the file and then you do operations within the file. Okay. So these, every single test starts off with staging. So we stage a test file that's been configured exactly for that test. So it has pre-built objects in the, in the file or whatever we need to have it in, in exactly the state that we want to test. Uh, so we copy that in to a test folder and then I run, then the test runs and the, the uh, test will do all the assertions as you said. The pattern is I assert something, I, I do something, 
I read it back to make sure it actually did it because I don't, you know, a, a click doesn't tell me if it clicked or not. I just, it just, I just know that it said it clicked. So I okay. will, I will then read the screen to see if that action actually occurred. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't, then I failed the test right away with an appropriate error message. And if it worked, then I go on and test the next thing. So it's test, check, fail if necessary. Check. Tests fail if necessary, and that's a repeating pattern through all the different screen interactions I have in the test. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's very different from uh, most unit tests, which uh, tend to test one single thing at a time. Mm -hmm. You're actually running a test and not even going to the next check unless the first test passes. Right, and so the second test is uh, in this in this example, the second test is actually dependent upon that you click that button successfully. Right. So what I consider a test is really can be if pretty complex set of actions. Maybe I'm building a whole a whole structure. And that structure actually, in terms of what's done on the screen, is multiple activities. So um, I broke up my code into what I call interactions and actions. So interactions are the discrete uh, actions, you know, clicking a button or typing in a box, something very discrete. And then an action is a subset of a test that is a combination of things. Um, for example, if I want to log into a file, I have to make sure the login screen is there, and I have to type in the username, type in the password, click the login. That's an action. It's a multiple Got it. interactions. Got it. Um, what's the output of this test run that you're doing? Is okay. it uh, a file or message? Well, or? yeah. So the output is obviously we, we, I log every single step, and so the logging is very detailed. You log it to a text file? Mm -hmm, to a text file, yep. And um, I think that's one of the one of the kind of cool things about that is that um, while I'm running the test, I'm just worried about the test and checking and failing, you know, and like that. But then when I when I'm done with all the tests, I want to send that email to our business users and to our tech our developers and myself of what happened. So like a part two of the of the test application is to go parse, I actually parse that entire log file. And based on what I see in that log file, I build the email that goes out. So that gives me the advantage of knowing that the email is accurate because that's, it came from the log. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I give them the list, you know, the number of, first of all, the environmental information, you know, what, when, what, time did I run and what machine, you know, we have connected devices, so which devices were connected and things like that. Um, and so all that's in the header and then how many tests passed, how many tests failed. If the test failed, I had the detailed um, uh, log entries for that test so I can see right in the email, you know, a pretty good summary of what actually happened. Right. And then a, a list of the tests that passed. Um, and one thing we've done uh, in part of our uh, development of this process is that we we have a database now of all the tests that run and when how long they took and and whether they passed or failed. So we're building this testing uh, database. Uh, we call it the test tracker database. And so based on that, then we can go in with, go in with Power BI and we can do trend uh, trend analysis. We can do reporting, things like that. Yeah, I think that uh, how long things took would be a good candidate for that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't test for that, or they, they but the but the fact they're recording it. Well, as you see, is the application getting slower over time? Right, or or if, if something consistently takes a certain amount of time, um, you know, is it suddenly slower? Well, that's an indication of an issue, yes. right? Right. Um, and uh, I actually, I'm looking at some of the notes that you sent me, and you said that uh, actually the screen doesn't have to be done drawing in order to run your tests. That's uh, well, that's interesting. It, it does have to be done drawing. That's one of the error. One of the challenges we faced was putting enough uh, validation oh, checking. Oh, I, enough I, I validation checking. Sentence before us. This is a challenge. <laughs> you have to wait for the screen to, to, to yeah. render. Yeah. Right. So we 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 had trouble with the login process where, you know, we were trying to log in before the logon screen even appeared. And so right. timing timing is an issue. Uh, that's probably the biggest challenge I have over all of this is just getting the timing right. Uh, that. You know, and I have two different sets of timings. Uh, when I run the nightly production run, it can run as slow as it wants. I don't really care. So if it finishes in, you know, 30 minutes, so what? Um, but when I'm testing at, you know, on my development machine, I don't want to take 30 minutes because I want to see the results and get back to working on the code. So, you know, having that balance between what the timing is while you're developing versus what the timing is when you're, in, you're running your nightly production tests is a challenge. Yeah. Any other challenges that you've faced that are significant? Um, I, I, 
I don't think so. I mean, we've already pretty much mentioned. I mean, the biggest lesson that I learned was to have the test be completely independent. Um, at the beginning, we were trying to, you know, get a bunch of tests together as fast as we could. So I would have one test to actually call another test because I'd already written that for that test. And it just made things too complex. It was too hard to, to, to work things out when things didn't work. So the lesson I learned there was it was worth the effort to um, have a completely independent test every single time, even if the code was very, very similar to another test. Mm, okay. So it's hard, it's hard to reuse your test code. Is what I'm hearing. Right. Right. I mean, th that's where the action and the interactions come in because that's a shared library across all the tests. So I can leverage a lot of the code that way. But I never have one test, one test call a test, another test anymore. I used to, but that, that's, that's done. No, we don't do that anymore. Um, another thing that we did, too, that I thought was uh, a lot of fun was uh, we integrated Snagit into the testing process. Really? I'm a yes. big Snagit fan. You yes. Know, they're based in Okemos, Michigan. Yes, a stone's throw from <laughs> where I live, yes. Um, so, uh, and they're actually moving to the uh, south. I think it's the southeast corner of Michigan State University. They're building new headquarters. Um, oh, very cool. But that's my so, alma mater, you know. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, I modified the code so that whenever a test would fail, it would instantly take a screenshot of the of the test screen at the point of failure. So that really helps. Oh, very cool. That really helps. Cool. So if a test fails, I can go look and see what it was doing at that moment without necessarily having to sit in front of the machine and, and watch it. Oh. Excellent. Um, where can people go to learn more about this and to get started with Fly UI? Well, Fly UI is an open source project, so it is on GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, there, that was another one of the challenges we faced was that there isn't a whole lot of information on the web about how to do this. Okay. Uh, and so that was my, one of my motivations for doing this session here was to kind of help get the word out that it's a very viable thing. Uh, it's mm -hmm. With Fly UI, it's working out very well for us and, and uh, as a company, and we're actually hoping to bring that into the work we do for you know other clients as well. We're trying to expand it. Um, yeah, very cool. I've got the uh, I'll put this in the show notes, but I've got the GitHub page up right now: GitHub.com/slash Fly UI mm -hmm. slash Fly UI. Mm -hmm. um, it yep. looks like it's maintained uh, by somebody in Switzerland and somebody in Romania, and then a few other people right. that have contributed. So Fly UI is actually an outgrowth of a prior open source project called, um, and, and some people may know uh, this particular name. Um, it's, uh, let's see here. It's called teststack.white. So, okay. So teststack.white was the original version of what became Fly UI, and um, they, in 2019, December 2019, they deprecated it because the architecture of the application just really wasn't in a way that would make it easy to implement uh, the UIA3 library. Mm -hmm. So they thought, well, if we're going to have to make a lot of changes to support UIA3, let's just start over and, and you know, take advantage of all the lessons learned. So mm -hmm. if you look at how long Fly UI has been around, understand that it's actually been around much longer. It's the second version. Got it. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Hmm. Um, I'm just thinking here for a second. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we want to do with this beyond just GUI testing, if that's all right. Yes, please. So, um, you know, the, the, the path, when we first started this, you know, we, we developed a, road, uh, a roadmap. And so the first part of the roadmap was to set up a silent install. So we had to have a silent installer of our application so it could update itself prior to running the tests. So we worked on that. And, and I made, I don't know if I mentioned, I'm actually on the development team of the product. I'm just the UI oh, really? tester of it. So huh. you, you know, this, this process can be used to work on applications that you don't have the source code for. But I'm lucky in that I, if I actually really, really need something changed in the application to support automation, I can contact the developers and say, hey, put this in. You know, I haven't had to do that much, but I, I had that option at least. Um, so we, did, we worked on a silent install, and then we worked on an FTP process where the, the, the development builds would go to an FTP server, and then we would download those prior to the uh, tests. Um, and then we went through and we automated just the, the, the happy path. That was the first 
part of it was so let's just get what we know the users tend to do, let's get that automated, make sure we can you know access everything, get everything to work. Hmm. And okay, so that we did happy pass first. And right. then we went into regression testing. And so we do still have manual testers. Automation testing never completely eliminates manual testers uh, and shouldn't. Uh, and so our man the manual testers actually now send me certain test situations, and they'll say, hey, we've seen this come up once or twice. You know, We want to make sure this doesn't happen again if we fix this. Uh, so they'll send me staging files, and then they'll send me the, the, a complete description of what's going on, and then that becomes an automated test. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, so they send the, the manual testers send me what they want as tests, which is great. Um, and then. That makes sense. And those yep. are the, because UI tests are ultimately driven by human behavior. It makes sense mm -hmm. that humans' actions should be driving yep. that. Yep. And so when I mentioned the Power BI uh, uh, dashboard. We haven't built the dashboard yet, but we're recording all the data we need for it through the test automation d database. Um, we uh, want we're going to put it into a, a DevOps pipeline. We haven't built made it into the DevOps pipeline yet, but it will be eventually will be part of the release process. Nice. Um, and um, we want to also develop a subset of tests, so I would call a smoke test, that makes it very, very easy for a developer to run a, the core set of tests, uh, even after a build, before we do any other testing, that they can do themselves before we bring it into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So we, we call those, you know, I would refer to those as smoke tests. Haven't done sure. it yet. It's on our roadmap. Uh, and then the final thing on our roadmap is the one where I really get excited. Um, what all this this is a a commercial product it is distributed around the world and mm -hmm. so you know support they have support staff and the support staff have to support many different versions with many different feature sets uh and so what we ultimately want to do is have it such that if a support person gets a, a support call of a certain version doing something that you know the user is having an issue with we want the support person to be able to log on to a screen, specify the version, and specify the test that covers that. And then it'll uh, go over to a test server. The test server will install that version, run that test, record it all on video, mm -hmm. and then send that video to the support tech. I see. So they'll they'll be able to see they'll be able to see uh, what our tests are showing for that particular situation, and then they can see if it's different from what the user is seeing, and, and and go on whatever. But but we feel that would be a very very useful uh, tool for support. I'm guessing that's where you're integrating Snagit into this. That would be the 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 video portion of Snagit. So far, we've integrated the the snapshot portion. But there's no reason why we couldn't. Uh, well, it sounds like a great tool. I'm really glad you're having success with it, and hopefully this gets the word out and gets people not only to try it, but maybe even to contribute to it. Right. Um, is it, you said it was a commercial commercial product, but it's also an open source product. So what's, so what's the difference there? The application I'm automating and testing is commercial. Fly UI, the library, is open source and freely available under the MIT license. All right. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot today. You're welcome. Thank you. And stay safe. You too. Well, we we have been we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic, and I'm I'm seeing the resurgence of in-person events, and that's awesome. Uh, but over the last two years, a lot of us have made friends virtual, right? Friends that we've made over, you know, Zoom or, or Teams uh, that we've actually never met. So I was thinking the other day, what kind of friends are those? Are those I friends? Are they E friends? Or just friends? So that's my contribution to uh, that uh, question. Uh, think about that. <laughs>